All right, everyone, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Carlos Tercios. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I am one of two coordinators for student diversity and inclusion within Campus Life's Mosaic, along with Aaron Waddles and a few of our city staff. So raise your hand if you work for Mosaic, just to know where you are. Um, so thank you for uh, coming and welcome. I'm excited to, kind of sh to share this evening with you. Um, and for those that who have missed previous pod talks before, the intention of this program was to create an interactive cultural sharing experience for everyone in the audience. Uh, pod talks is a series geared to highlight the richness of various cultures through speakers from around the country representing various backgrounds. As someone who's always willing to learn, I hope that this series serves as an engaging learning experience that you can share with the rest of the UBC community. Um, so now to proceed for tonight's events, it's my honor to introduce our featured guests for this evening, Queen Earth and Jay, who will be presenting uh, Queer Core. Uh, as a musical genre, Queer Core is distinguished by lyrics exploring themes related to sexuality, gender identity, and expression. Uh, queer Core Behind the Music gives life to the stories behind Queener's coming out songs and seeks to inspire others to share their experiences. Members of the queer community, especially students, are encouraged to share in their performance. Uh, today, Queen Earth is co-facilitating with uh, Jay Little. Uh, Jay? Yes, Jay Little. Um, and their aim is to create a safe and brave space where audience members and participants can share the most intimate pieces of themselves without judgment or fear of rejection. It is ultimately our intersecting identities of gender, culture, race, class, sexuality, age, uh, and others that make us unique. To those who are unfamiliar with Brave Space guidelines, I would like to read the one we utilize that is adapted from the UBC's Women's Center. Uh, so community members engage in critical dialogue through conscious questioning and active listening. While all are expected to make their best efforts to be respectful, there is an understanding that someone may say something that results in unintentional offense and hurt feelings for those around. A primary assumption of Brave Space is that everyone speaks with positive intent and seeking greater knowledge and understanding. So I ask everyone in the room to challenge yourself while respecting others in order to cultivate community learning. Uh, by reading this, I hope we can create a space where everyone feels comfortable sharing their experiences and being open to asking uncomfortable questions. We ask that you ask any questions that, that are respectful and honor confident, confident confidentiality in anything that is shared. In recognition of Black History Month, our event tonight will be geared to exploring varying levels of interactions between black and LGBTQ plus identity. Although black and LGBTQ plus uh, voices are both marginalized identities within society that privileges white and straight identities, it is important to note that black and brown voices have historically been erased within the queer community, and that is still relevant in today's world. We hope that we are able to co-create a space that highlights the voices of people of color and our LGBTQ plus community. This is why I would like to invite folks after um, the performance by Queener to uh, an open mic uh, performance. We'll only have about 20 minutes or so for this, so, so I apologize if not everyone can perform. Uh, but if you do wish to perform, please go up to the front to the check-in table to fill out our video release form. As a thank you, you will receive our special Mosaic 15th anniversary mug and t-shirt giveaways. Uh, feel free to leave uh, if you have an evening class or just need to leave early, uh, but please fill out our evals on both sides before you leave. It is really helpful for us in order to make uh, better uh, programming. Uh, our last point is I encourage you to also check in the sign-in table for all of the, our other events that we have uh, for the rest of the spring semester, including our next event, Black, Queer, and Here, uh, led by Sylvia Anakam, our Mosaic intern for Black and Africana Student Engagement as a part of our What's the Tea social justice dialogue series. This session will explore the intersection of shared experiences of black and queer identity while enjoying some tea and snacks. Uh, the event will be next Wednesday in Commons 331 from 5.30 to 7 p.m. And with that, I would like to invite uh, both Queen Earth and Jay to the podium. Where's my mic's not on? There we go. Sweet. What's up, UMBC? How's tacos? Yeah. 
Thank you so much for having us, Carlos. Uh, we were supposed to be here back in September. Lots of things were happening on campus, so we are happy uh, to be back. Uh, Jay and I have been facilitating together for, oh my god, almost two years now. Um, so uh, this is great to come back to campus and do this. So welcome to Queer Core. Uh, this is really about storytelling and visibility. Um, no, technology. Sorry. Oh, it's that button, thanks. So a little bit about tonight. <laughs> no, still not working. I turned it on. Wait, what did you do? <gasps> Look at that. All right, so there's your little agenda because we're adults and we like to know like, you know, how this thing is gonna proceed. So we're gonna start with some introductions and then we're gonna jump into the storytelling. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, I guess it would be a songwriter round robin, but I'm a songwriter and you're a storyteller. So we're gonna kind of go back and forth and kind of share some experiences and reflections that we've had and then we open it up to you, like Carlos said, and then there's a Q&A. Uh, you know, depending, if nobody gets up for Q&A or for open mic, that's fine. People have questions. Bring them. Um, we're really excited to talk to you. A little bit about me. Um, we love Insta Insta media. Yes, Insta media. We love Instagram and social media. So if you want to follow, uh, I'm at Miss Queen Earth. A uh, little bit about me. I am a singer songwriter, educator, uh, social justice uh, worker. I love to bring music together uh, to. Um, share stories in my songwriting and uh, kind of make space for others because I found a lot of obstacles in my way just as a queer black woman and so I figured I'd bring those to light and also make space for others. This is my co-facilitator, Jay. Hey everybody, I'm excited to be here at UMBC with you all, Queen Earth, thank you Mosaic. Uh, I'm an early childhood educator for about 13 years. I now work uh, for an organization that does racial equity and I also do teacher education at Towson. Um, currently, I'm most excited that my partner is cooking a little baby, yes. so we're really excited that our family is going to be growing, and it really makes me even more um, excited to create these spaces where we can all see lots of perspectives and make sure that those are honored in our world as we move forward. Thank you, Joanna. Cool. That was their slide for that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, uh, like we said, we're going to you know make space and visibility, and then also um, end with an open mic. But I think, Jay, uh, first story is on you. Thanks. The shape of my body never fit into the lens of your thoughts. Throughout my life, I had a sense of rejecting the idea of fitting into something while secretly searching for places where I do fit. As a child, I was raised in a 50s, middle class, um, suburbia housing development. Predominantly white, we had an asphalt pathway to the school that I went to and to the community pool. I can clearly remember the smell of sweat and fresh cut grass and hearing yelling from inside my house from my parents and outside from the kids in the neighborhood. As I grew up, at family functions, at different religious holidays, going out with my friends, uh, different venues, I felt like I was always the least dressed up when it comes to fitting into the shape, to the structures that isn't the shape of my body. One day as a young child, pulling up to my grandfather, to my grandmother's house, we went into the driveway that was adorned with these strange white lion sculptures. We could see their rancher house where on holidays, men wore jackets. Uh, men wore jackets at the dinner table. That was one of those rules that was spoken, amongst many unspoken rules. That day, I was breaking one of those. I showed up in an outfit. I thought it was pretty great. I remember fighting to wear it. It was a red corduroy overalls that were also shorts. I feel like it'd be really popular now. I'd be like super hipster trendy. <laughs> that day, I was sure, though, that it was clearly not accepted. I couldn't process those feelings that I was having in my body, the sense. The air around me, though, from that day, I won't forget. I didn't fit into that structure that wasn't the shape of my body. Years later, as a senior on the women's lacrosse team in high school, uh, on game day, the team was supposed to dress up. I had to fit that whole role as it was provided. I had to do the right thing. I had to put my body somewhere it didn't make sense for me. I found myself trying to fit in again, 
I stood there wearing a long skirt, the kind that only had a slit on one side because then I only had to shave one leg. I thought, this is at least better. Like, okay, I'm figuring this out. It didn't fit into the structure that wasn't the shape of my body. That same summer, my parents got divorced. I was living with my mom for the first time, with just my mom. My sister was at college, my dad had moved across town. I was looking through some papers, and as I drug my hand down, I came across this list, and there it was. I saw wedding. I think my mom was making a list of things she was worried about paying for in the future for my sister and I, and I thought, how did she see this? Was I wearing a white dress, a veil? Did she see me in ways I'd never seen myself? I don't fit into the structure that isn't the shape of my body. When I learned about gender as a child, I learned about men and women. When I watch you know, and consume the media today, I see commercials that show jobs for dads, jobs for moms. This false reality of either or thinking is not historically accurate and doesn't depict the realities that people are living. I never had a strong relationship with my sister. I've tried over time and romanticized the idea of having close relationships with siblings through watching others and seeing people's relationships. Last year I tried to connect with her a little more. I tried to let her know more about who I am and how I navigate the world. I said to her, hey, I want to let you know I'm genderqueer, I use they, them pronouns, I also use the name J, just the letter. Her response laid in this pattern of either or thinking that we often want to justify, that there's a true need to understand gender, gender as a spectrum. She said, in the way I see gender, I think it's really important to see you as a masculine woman. What she didn't give me space for to appreciate is the beauty of gender fluidity. I think there's a strong need to understand what we learn about women and men and the ways we are supposed to look and the rules we are supposed to follow. They're messed up. Which women are awesome? They hold a place on this gender spectrum. I just don't exist in that construct. I don't feel relationship or a bond with that. However, for me, being misgendered as a woman also feels like a fuck you to the gender binary versus a microaggression towards me. It's not like I'm feeling seen or heard for the person that I am, but it does hold space to just sort of begin to bash that system down as we see it. Our thoughts can be broken by their boundedness to an idealized world that isn't meant to work for everyone. And our language is important. Exposing ourselves and young folks to multiple perspectives, multiple ways of knowing, of being changed, that can change our mindset. It can change our understanding. And it can change how we look at the world around us. We can create that change by pushing through those boxes and creating places that fit all of our structures that we are and the structures that we will become. So if you, you can clap after every story just to, to let you be prepared. Jay's gonna do four and I'm gonna do four, so there'll be eight rounds of clapping. You can say it to the end, no worries. We, we appreciate it either way. Uh, I guess it's a little like housekeeping stuff. Um, thank you, Jay. Um, we talk a lot about language um, and, and like words and, and names that we have for things. And Queer Core was started um, from an incident at a farmer's market. So in the summer of 2010, I quit a job and was like, I'm gonna do music and dove face first into it, and uh, I, I'm still doing it today, almost nine, 10 years later. At the time, I learned very quickly that I do not like playing music in bars. It's not really my thing. I don't like to play fast songs, don't really like to drink anymore, and why am I awake this late? Like, what's going on? So, I like lunch brunch, happy hour, in the farmer's market. So, that summer of like 2012, 
I set off on this adventure. Started getting more and more farmer's market gigs. And um, I had this woman who really wanted me to come to her farmer's market. She's like, you have a great voice. Let's have a phone call and talk about logistics. And I'm like, sweet. Getting gigs, I was going to be like a world famous farmer's market singer. I was on my way. Um, but we had this very interesting phone call. She was like, yeah, I love, I love the sound of your voice. I just want to make sure that you know, it's, it's family friendly, because you know, this is a family farmer's market. And I'm like, oh my god. So at the time, I was learning more about how to be an entrepreneur, right? Like, if I really want to be a musician and I want people to take myself seriously, then I have to take my business seriously. So I always had, uh, at the time, two emails. There's an email of me doing like Eminem covers in my basement that I send to bars. And there's another video of me doing like Dixie Chicks. And that's what I send to the farmer's market. Because that's what you do. It's marketing, right? Pick your audience. And I'm thinking, she goes, yeah, this farmer's market needs to be appropriate. I'm like, oh my god, did I send you the Eminem video? I'm like freaking out. And, and I, I just flat out asked her, I said, can you tell me specifically what you're talking about? Because I was like, I'm not, you know, I, I, want, I want this, this job. I'm going to the farmer's markets. And she goes, well, you were singing to a woman. And I was like, like this light went off in my head. I was on the corner of like 25th and, and Howard. Like, I will never forget that. And I realized that one single letter of the alphabet was going to be the thing that was going to keep me from making a living and having an opportunity like my friends. And I was like, um, I don't want to play at your market. Have a nice day. I hung up the phone. And I called a bunch of my friends to like vent, because that's what you do. But ultimately, I learned that I needed to carve out my own way. And I'm learning more that like, we're never really alone, right? People say, I did this all by myself. No, you didn't. You absolutely did not. There's always somebody along the way to help you, even if it doesn't seem like there's a lot. So that season, or I guess before that season, I knew that I was going to set off on this journey and make music. I didn't know where it would take me, but um, this is a song that I wrote to kind of, without it, probably wouldn't have even had that farmer's market conversation. So this is what if. Thank you. 
But even as I write this down, I feel a rush of worry that the words play and children coming out of my mouth, my body, people will judge me, people will see me, maybe as a predator. This is a job I love to do. Cis women can have this experience, though still under conditions of systemic oppression. Do they fear these questions? Cis men are often congratulated when they're being caregivers. I worked at a rock climbing gym where, I got past, where one day they got passed down a new policy. You had to spot the same gender young children as you were. So spotting, you're like, what is that? So when there was no rope and they were climbing side to side, they might fall down and break their necks. We were supposed to catch them. That seemed really important. We got this new policy that said, same gender spotting. What does that mean for me? <laughs> and how might, how might that be that people are thinking about me? These questions, questioning my own personal experience, I just didn't understand. And just this month, in the women's locker room, why did that woman look at me? I was even only in there to pee. At the Y in Towson, they have lockers outside the locker room. This is really exciting for me. I don't even have to go in there. But it's not practical, because I still have to change my clothes, go to the bathroom sometimes. Some kids one day in the locker room, whose faces looked like they hadn't seen my body in that space before. It didn't fit. It leaves the question in my mouth. Do I scare them? Do they just not understand because we are so impressed by what gender has to look like, conform to? This is a job I love, caring for children, their growth, and their journeys. Through my anti-racist training, we have learned oppression is dynamic. I've had, up to this point, people had to really try to explain that to me over time. But to have to taste it has made me rethink all of my experiences, leaving me with continuous questions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in this picture here? Some good stuff happening. Well, you know, my first drag role was the Lorax, <laughs> which I always dressed up as in my classroom and would only respond to being called the Lorax. <laughs> also, this is my uh, favorite, favorite gift I was given as a teacher. I used to be really, really serious with kids about only certain things. One was letting things grow. Don't pick the flowers, they're growing. Try to like give them the idea of let them grow. So they were really, really excited about that. And this kid one day brought me petals that had clearly already fallen off of the flowers. And then he glittered them and brought them to me in a gallon Ziploc bag. And it was the best present <laughs> I've ever gotten in 13 years of teaching. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you know, to continue the conversation about language and you know, what words mean, uh, this is a song that I've never done um, for queer core, but um, it, it keeps coming up. Um, a lot of college for me was about learning about my own history. I went to a co-ed college prep boarding school in Wheeling, West Virginia, so I think there were like, I graduated with 67 people. I think there were three black kids and one of them was my prom date. Um, so when I got to college, I decided that I wanted to learn more about who I was um, and really dig in, into history, because I'd only gotten like one perspective. Um, so I, I minored in history and Pan-African studies, and you know, we learned about uh, African Americans before, I'm sorry, Africans before slavery, the diaspora, exploration, like what we were doing. And something that, that keeps coming up a lot in my circle is this idea that, um, you know, colonizers for watching Black Panther, Europeans, whatever you want to call them, um, they didn't kidnap slaves. 
right? We weren't like slaving over in Africa. We were people, we were doctors and parents and preachers and healers and, and an entire community and a culture. And so uh, when Jay and I were pre pre preparing this, they were like, wait, let's talk about this, this language. What does it mean when you say enslaved? versus slave. And slave gives you the idea that maybe perhaps at one time prior to this captivity situation, right, there was a life and a family and, and purpose and meaning versus to just assuming that someone is a slave. So um, a year ago, I had an opportunity to write a song for a woman who, uh, she created a podcast. She called it Collared. It's a podcast for women of color who are called to the cloth. And I was like, that's, that's really clever. She's like, no way, check it out, like, it's deep. So she said, collared because a preacher wears a collar. Collared because a slave wears a collar around their neck when they're trying to run away. And collared because those are the greens that we pull from the earth to eat and nourish ourselves. So I was really excited to write this song. Well, want want part is that she didn't pick it for her podcast. That's fine. I'm not pissed. Whatever. But um, I'm glad that I got to write this piece because every Sunday morning, almost religiously, no pun intended, I listen to gospel. Um, I haven't been to church for years. It's just how I was brought up. But there's a lot of talk as an extension of this conversation of pre-slavery and what it means to be, you know, of African descent. You know, there's a lot of conflict in the community about Christianity and if African Americans, like, if we should embrace it. And you know uh, this rejection of of homosexuality. You know, one morning I was listening to this song called "Break Every Chain." Anybody listen to gospel? Break Every Chain. Oh my God, this song is so good. But it was the live version, so I'm like in the kitchen making my food, mind my business, and she starts like ad libbing about how if you want to break off the chains of homosexuality, and I was like, you just ruined and killed my entire pancake morning. You know, because it's like I'm thinking, oh look at us like celebrating. Nah, no, not you. You get to be on the outskirts. So I wrote this song, Collard, to remind me where I come from, what I am, and what it means to be a descendant of people who have done great things, who have traveled a far journey, and who are still here. So this is Collard. I was 
Well, that was really beautiful. <laughs> I actually hadn't heard that song before, and I'm really glad I heard it all with you, uh, with, here with you today. Thank you. So I grew up outside of D.C. I was pretty familiar with taking the Metro. I loved and still do, you know, to play that game where you're like, I won't fall down, I'm stronger than this train. So one time on the Metro, I'm on the way to D.C., I'm playing this balance game, I am stronger than a train. A young, bright face looks up to me, wondrous eyes, two-sided glasses. The young eyes look at me, then look up to their mom and say, is that a boy or a girl? The mom says, shh, as she pulls the child out of sight. And I stand there thinking, I am stronger than this train. <laughs> Things like this have happened to me my entire life. Sometimes they, are, they create a preliminary fear of how others will see me. How they may fear discussion of who I am. I taught pre-kindergarten and kindergarten for over 10 years. I feared parents seeing my name assigned at birth on their four-year-old's welcome letter. Maybe they wonder, what will this teacher be like? I fear when they meet me, I will not, they won't see my abilities to connect with their children. They will only see a box that I'm not checking off. I am grateful to be myself, disproving the ways in which we often are taught about gender. Do you see me? Are you a boy or a girl? A question the children whisper at recess or often ask me in large crowds. They love me just the same, building relationships with me that allow me to teach them through their own interests. And then they ask me again, are you a boy or a girl? And I say, you know, I think we already discussed this. Do you remember what I said? They would often look at each other and giggle and say, we know you aren't either, and run off and play. The children continue to trust me and build relationships with me. These children seem to care, not because it changes their feelings about me, but because, because they're trying to fit me into their perspectives, their framework, something they can understand. I took a job as an early childhood literacy and project specialist. Thank you. Good title. Thank you. Uh, at a local fancy charter school in my old neighborhood. This was an amazing opportunity uh, that let me work with lots of different children. I got to do cool projects that were all based on their own interests. In this role, though, outside of the classroom, my relationships with children with children were different. It wasn't the same as when we had spent 40 hours a week together in the same classroom, where you know, we happened to really get to know each other. And in this job, I was hanging out with the kindergartner. Usually, she's usually pretty quiet, pretty quiet, really sweet. She and I had walked around the school earlier in the school year and made a huge map of the entire school. We sounded out letters, we drew pictures. And that day, she turned to me and said, little, that's what they call me. She said, little, are you a boy or a girl? And I responded, I'm not either. And she said, so you don't exist? Yeah. <laughs> Just do it. Love it. A lot of the work that, that I do, not so much like here, but you know, I have like six jobs. My friends laugh at me. I think it's seven. I just told Amelia I counted my seventh job. Um, and I told my mentor that I was going to write a book called Seven Irons in the Fire. She's just laughing at me. But it's, it's real. I have lots of different jobs. Um, but for me, it's been about bringing everything that I love to do together, right? Um, if I started off, you know, in higher ed, doing events and, and multicultural affairs and student activities, then, you know, when I decided to do music, 
I was like, never again, higher ed, and then here I am, <laughs> ten, 10 years later. But somewhere in between, you know, I was back on college campuses and teaching, and um, then I moved away to California and London, and it was really hard to be black in San Jose. If anyone's ever been in Silicon Valley, it's like 3% African American. And um, when I saw black people out there, they were like homeless, on the corner in need of mental health help. And so this like reflection, I didn't have a mirror for myself. I didn't know anyone who looked like me out there. And it was really, really challenging. And when I came back from that adventure, I ended up working at a startup, which was weird because I was out there in California and you know, nobody was trying to hire me for anything. But I realized that like I had this unique skill set because of music, because of the way that I did business for Queen Earth that a lot of it was transferable. So I got this sweet job at a startup and um, I was already like apprehensive and uncomfortable because I was like, I've been to San Jose, like I know what the deal is out there. Like I know there's, there's not gonna be any black people at work. Maybe I'll have one black friend, which is always very exciting if you have a black friend at work. Anybody have a black friend at work? Raise your hand. That's what's up. <laughs> But uh, I got to this job, and I, I got this really awesome supervisor who's also a UMBC graduate. And he told me on my first day of work, he said, Missy, don't stop making music. I was like, who are you? <laughs> he said, you're going to hate it here, and you're not going to do good work for us. He said, if you found that thing that you love, and you've made this like conscious decision to come back into the workplace, he's like, don't, don't ever stop making music. He said, if you have a gig or a queer core, he's like, we're going to help you out. And he told me that a lot of people, he said, are heads down. They have no idea what's going on in the world. He's like, they're not aware. He's like, you're here. And he's like, you have, he, he just knew that, that things were going to be different and uncomfortable for me. So at that point in my life, I realized that, I'm sorry, I got laid off. My whole team got laid off and the company got bought. That's what happens sometimes with startups. Um, I learned that it wasn't about the job. It wasn't about that company, right? Because we live in a time where I'm not gonna work somewhere for the next 20 years and then retire. That's just not our narrative. So what does it mean for me to find my purpose and to never lose sight of that? So at the time I was blogging and I found this really awesome quote um, and it just reminded me like to always think of like big picture, right? Why do I wanna work here? How does it feed me? And it's almost like when you come up with your own like personal mission statement, your own personal brand, whatever you wanna call it, it makes those decisions very easy. You know, I know what I wanna do, maybe what I don't wanna do, what I can do. So I wrote a song about what it means um, to be a person of color, you know, in these interesting tech environments, even higher ed to itself is just, um, I crave a world of like more inclusion, but if that happened, maybe we wouldn't even have to be up here doing queer core in the first place. But I'm okay with that, right? So this is Melissa. Nobody calls me Melissa except for my parents when I'm in trouble and someone who's signing a check. But when I got this job at the startup, I was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna have them call me Melissa. So that way, if they ever see me in public and call me Melissa, I don't really have to answer because nobody calls me Melissa. So. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so I wrote a song about that. This is Melissa.
People ask me all the time, they say open mic, is that like only for singers? No, it's for everybody. Imagine a world where we could be that, that inclusive I and mean, make people feel welcome. Or imagine a world where we had rooms like that and then we're like, you know what? Just beatboxers tonight, everybody else get out, because that's okay too. So for me, open mics have been a way for me to learn about myself and to even learn about people in the community that maybe I didn't even know they existed. Um, but I think it's been my call to create space for other people. So for my last song, it's called Much More Than an Open Mic, ironically. Um, Red Bull was in town like a year and a half ago, and they were pairing up artists and entrepreneurs. So I got paired up with, I'm, I'm an artist, and I got paired up with an entrepreneur who runs an open mic. We kind of looked at each other and were like, we can switch roles and it would still be cool. But we had this really awesome conversation about open mics and inclusion and exclusivity and like, what does it mean to say that a space is welcoming and open and to be able to lead people into that space and do it well. So um, to prime the pump and get you excited about getting up here, and even if you don't, um, this is a song that I wrote called Much More Than an Open Mic.
So this is where we open it up. Open mic. Uh, if anybody wants to share any stories, it's not really like, there's no pressure. You can play my guitar. If you don't have anything that you want to share, then we can jump into the Q&A. This is my favorite slide, BS. This is a brand new deck that we made just for today. This is my favorite slide. Um, but if anybody has any questions, this is where we open it up for y'all. How are the tacos? Good. Thumbs up over here. What's up? That's it. Yes. What's up, Reese? Is that a question? No, I was just saying the tacos are good. <laughs> No, that's pretty much it. Is that a question or a stretch? Yes. What's up? It's cool. What's up? Um, okay, so as a queer, non-binary artist myself, mm -hmm. um, who's still trying to figure out their own path, um, how, what, what, um, uh, what venues have you found in like the local area that have been really accepting and awesome, or, or creating <coughs> yourself? I think we could both take this because we hang out. Like we're neighbors, we share an alley, we just visit each other all the time, but we hang out in different pockets of, of the Baltimore scene. So I think for me, I think that where there's art, there are queer folks, <laughs> you know? But that doesn't always mean that we have a space. Um, so I think that, mm, yeah, go I'll on. give you one. Do that, do that. The second Tuesday of every month, oh my God. Queen Earth hosts <laughs> an open mic at the Motor House, uh, where Queen Earth also is doing a residency. So you can check that out. And that open mic is very open. Well, thank you. No, yeah, I think that um, I met you at the improv group, right? So we were just talking before the show. I think that um, in general, the GLCCB, which is now the Maryland Pride Center, they do an open mic there, I think like every first Friday. But um, there aren't, there isn't really a queer exclusive place that I can think of, um, but there are places that are welcome. I know that if you go into DC, like the completely different scene, right? They, they definitely have more pockets, but I think it also depends on the kind of art that you're looking for. Like I think Station North itself is pretty queer. So like if you're trying to book shows um, or work with people, that community seems pretty open and I think like it's safe to, safe, whatever that means. Uh, safe to say that you would be welcomed there versus some other pockets of the city. You know, like as an artist, um, you know, going on the Fells Point, lots of white boys with guitars. That's not really my scene, and I just wanted to be like, you know what, I'm not going to compete with you guys. I'm going to kind of make my own lane, and no one's playing music at brunch. You know? So I think that it's just about finding your people, but also like, if mm, safety is a big, we could talk about safety all night. You know, like, do you feel safe when you walk in a room? And you don't know the answer to that question until so you find the strength to leave the house, right? And figure out if this place is safe. So keep digging, but I like that question. So maybe we should keep in touch. Yeah. Yes. You can put there again, right? Yes. <laughs> Any other questions about queerness, identity, inclusion, early childhood education? Yeah. Just enthusiasm. Carlos, thank you. Thank you. Anybody got any Tupperware? Right? Low in a foil? I think we can get to think of a question. Just go for it. So I can just kind of tell a story without like breaking, you know, not, they're not too personal. Jess and I know each other for like 10 years. And, and like we, we kind of came out like at the same time together and like found this city. And I feel like it's changed so much in the past 10 years from being like Mount Vernon is this like gay hub to closing of the hippo, which is like a gay hub, hip hop, black hub to like, uh, I don't know what's going on at Grand Central because I, I just don't go there anymore. Flavors for sale, like the building itself is for sale, not the business, which is smart because the real estate investor is like, that's brilliant. You're gonna keep the business in there, collect those checks every month, but somebody else takes care of the maintenance. But it, it's, it's, it's this constant ebb and flow in the scene and I think that Baltimore is very queer, but um, the, what did the Eagle just closed? What was it, the Eagle or the? No, it was the memory open and then it closed no, there was again, another bar. Again. Oh, what is it called? It just happened like last week. Last week? Yeah, there was a, another queer bar. So I think that we are constantly trying to find spaces for ourselves. Like my dream would be to have my own bar. And everybody's allowed to come in there except for haters, right? <laughs> um, but that's what I would love to do just to create more, like literally, like this is awesome, right? But to be able to own and have my own building and space 
for artists to come and like if someone asks that question I would like them to say you need to go over to whatever I'm gonna call my space, you know? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so when you first started um, with your music and you started like you decided like I'm gonna get out there, I'm going to put myself out there, were there any self doubts that you had? And if so how did you kind of go on a journey of getting more comfortable or getting over? Never afraid. Just just Nothing could stop me. Just kept going. No, um, it's hard. Like, I worked in higher ed, and um, in general, like, I love it. I, like, that's why I'm here. I love higher ed, right? And so I think that there's there's a, a want and a need for diversity, but it often doesn't manifest itself in the way that we choose faculty, staff, leadership, right? And like, that's a lot of industries. That's that's tech, right? We have this idea and this thing that we want to do. So for me, it was really cool that I could like adjacently still kind of like touch it. So the challenges came for me like being, I maybe, I don't want to say like on campus full time, but that, that was hard in a lot of ways. And I think that once I stepped back, I was able to kind of like reframe that relationship and, and just be more intentional about um, my relationships with people in higher ed. Like um, I've met some awesome people at UB doing a show over there um, who just continue to do great work. So I think that me walking away from, from this thing for a little bit allowed me to get a new perspective and kind of re-encounter it in, in a new in a new way, because I love higher ed. I, I, had, I was like one of those lucky people that had really good teachers. Um, I used to want to like live at my boarding school because I never wanted to leave. So I think, you know, it's not always easy. I think that your community is your greatest asset, right? Like, I get stuck. Jay could like dance circles around me for like inclusion and, and, and equity training, and that is like, and I know that, so like we can sit down and have really good conversations, and I can take what could just be a song about collard greens and turn it into something extremely meaningful. So I think that when I get stuck, the community is always there to help me. So like find your mastermind group and the people that you can come together with, you'll never be stuck if you have a group of people like that around you. I read <laughs> Anyway, um, so you talk about symbols and how like in, well, just like in a general sense, symbols mean a lot to uh, people who do the art. What is a symbol that means the most to you? Ooh. I don't know if it's a symbol, but I think I'm clairvoyant sometimes. Like I'll draw a picture in my journal and then like three years later I'll be standing somewhere like in that exact spot and it's creepy. So that makes me not want to stop doing art because who knows what else I'm going to encounter that's going to come back to me. So I don't know if it's a symbol as much as it is the process of doing art to continue to like dig into myself. Let's go on this side of the room. So, uh, yes, Carlos. Um, so just a question, because you talked during your presentation about uh, finding your people and finding your, like, your space. How, um, how do you navigate spaces when um, spaces, in, speaking in general, are, uh, are straight for the most part? And then queer spaces are mainly for like men identified queer people. Uh, like how how are those spaces kind of navigated as non man identified queer folks? I don't care. I just go. Like let me just make you uncomfortable, right? Like I think that mm, the world would love for me to like stay at home and not go out in those spaces, right? Because then I have to make white men or other people uncomfortable. Like, I'm getting into real estate investing. Everybody that I talk to is a white man, right? And I'm like, they're like, come to a real estate investor meetup. I'm like, shit, that's not my space. Do I belong there? Are they gonna take me seriously? I don't know. I do business consulting. We are uh, run by like queer, trans, like leadership group. And we call people to just do business. And they know we're black because it's on our email signature picture thing. And they talk to us about price before they offer us services. So like, I don't, I don't have an answer to like, what do you do? You just keep plugging away. Because honestly, it's 2019. Nobody should be the first anything, but we're still dealing with that. If I choose to stay at home, then like, what does it mean to my niece, my nephew, right? Who's like looking up to me and want, I want the world to be different for them when they grow up. Like I hope my niece never has to talk to anybody about her hair, ever. But if I don't wear my natural, she will. So I think just showing up is the most important. What do you, what? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I agree. I think just being present and trying to be in spaces and bring people with me that I know support me, um, do collaborating, yeah. I think is a really big thing and even collaborating um, with people who maybe aren't queer or don't understand that identity. I've been doing that a little bit. It's really expanded all of our knowledge and expanded um, the ways that we can reach people. So yeah, you do a lot of like white people training, right? So like, how do you, <laughs> it's the thing. It's the we thing. need it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here for you and hopefully you'll be there for me. <laughs> You know, it's like um, we don't examine our own culture to understand how we intersect with others, and I think that dialogue is a beautiful thing. Um, you can hurt lots of people's feelings with like the wrong words, but sometimes you have to say those words and know they're wrong in order for them to be right next time they come out of your mouth. I think that continue to be brave and show up is, is the best thing you can do. Um, you know, if somebody tells you they don't want you somewhere, what does that mean? It makes me want to be there even worse, right? But, I don't know, I would just say continue to show up for yourself first and, you know, be safe because you can't just go everywhere you want to go. That's dangerous. This comes up a lot. Safety. Mm -hmm. You know, that's probably like one of the most, um, I don't want to say popular, but it's a common question. People wondering about safety and how we feel showing up as ourselves in different spaces and what that's like. Mm -hmm. And I feel... Um like it's really important in the teacher education that I do to be really queer and be really myself. I talk about my family. Um, I talk about myself so, because I know that there are educators, people who want to be educators in that room that are also queer, whether they're identifying like that in my class or not. Uh, so hoping to just continue to bridge those things. You know, maybe I'm not there first. Maybe I am, but so they can see themselves and see that school doesn't can look in any way, teachers can look and be in any way, and we can be honest. I think for a long time I um, envied, you know, teachers whose partners could come in and say hi to them in their classroom and give them a kiss when they gave them a lunch bag or something like that. And I thought, is that my life? Will that ever be my life where I can do that? Is that appropriate in front of young children? How is that different? For me, is it, should it be, should I have to question this? So being able to be in that space, I really try to put myself in that um, forefront and think about my safety, but also try to be a model um, to bash down some of those spaces where maybe people haven't seen someone like me before. Yes. I'm almost. They want to the other talk. They want to the other talk. That's what they did. Time. Thank you all so much. Oh wait, one more slide. Don't clap yet. Hey, hey. All the songs you heard tonight can be purchased. <laughs> CDs are free for three for ten dollars. And I also have CDs. If and I take cash, PayPal, and crypto. If somebody plays pays me in Ethereum, I will laugh so hard, but it would make my day. Other than that, thank you so much, UNBC. Um, you know, from from bad weather to good weather. Thank you, Carlos, for having us on campus. Um, this was awesome, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did. So, uh, do we have an open mic list, or are we just gonna go? I feel like we're just gonna go. Okay. <laughs> do we have a list somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And then I'll call you. I, I also have jokes and banter in between. So uh, get ready. Here we go. If anybody wants to play my guitar, you're more than welcome to.
So let me see. I get to be Jimmy Fallon. Y'all just wait. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we got uh, Trace performers. I'm going in order. Um, thank you, first of all, for getting up to be brave. I know that there are some folks here um, kind of on the sidelines. I guess we should talk about like open mic rules. Rule number one, respect the mic. What does that mean? Somebody's on the mic, just be quiet. That's all. Up first on the open mic list, I guess we're going to do like one piece, one or two pieces. Two. Don't do two seven minute pieces, because there are people that do that stuff. We're not doing that tonight. But up first on open mic list, everybody please give a warm welcome to Sophia Barrios. Tiwa. 
Hello. Hello. I'm going to do two pieces. Is that is that cool? No, they're not that long. They're not that long. Okay, you got it. Get in there. Sylvia's trying to tell me something, but I can't even see that far. So. Oh, okay. Come on, keep up. Um. All right, first one. Uh, one day this broken planet would explode or the sun would eat all of us and our bodies would be fragmented into a tiny million pieces and our blood would evaporate into droplets double that number scattered across the cosmos and galaxies each bit starting new life in unknown star systems or becoming cosmic storms that sing ecstatically of our love for eternity and the year after that, and the years after that. Maybe we'll become the stuff of legends that alien, chir alien children chirp and mutter about, plastered in the heavens as immortal light fixtures, constellations of earthly love, made permanent, intertwining with one another like silver thread in God's endless nighttime embroidery. Now isn't that just grand? But for now, we're here on Earth, doomed to explode, and fated to reunite in infinity. went on a bit longer than I expected, so I will do something weird but short. Hey, that's right. It's weird, so you're even gonna snap after it if you're like, what? It's cool. I was like, what too? Um, <laughs> on the first week of the 13th year, the cold winds came, stealing the heat, killing the sheep, and destroying the harvest. The hungry villagers cried out, asking, how will we survive this winter? Who will save us? So the young girl gathered her garbs, and on the second week of the 13th year, she entered a thicket known as the Self, barehanded in search of game. Two days, five days, 14 days passed, and no one heard from her and presumed her dead. On the 15th week of the 13th year, the huntress returned, bloodied and scarred, with the corpse of the most beautiful creature slung over her shoulder, as beautiful as the girl once was before leaving for the hunt. Not a single blemish on its ebony skin. Its eyes reflected the wonderment that once lived there. The young huntress threw her innocence at the feet of the villagers and told them, come and eat, and they did. They dragged her purity across the sand and bled it out. They ate of her organs and grew stronger. They bit into her flesh and grew full. They bowed her bones and drank the broth and became warm. The villagers did not thank the girl, nor did they weep for her, not that they had to. She could weep all by herself. She was a woman now. The huntress sat far from the feast and fire and communed with the dark, darkness within. What would happen when the greedy villagers ate all of her innocence? What if they grew hungry and cold again? Maybe then she'd venture back into herself and bring them her goodness this time, maybe her kindness the next time, and her joy the other. Eventually she knew she would have to offer her empty carcass to the greedy villagers to ravage a body devoid of every virtue but freedom. On the seventh week of the 13th year, the cold winds returned and the people grew uneasy. So the huntress gathered up her garbs and entered the thicket barehanded. She was a woman now. Thank you, John. I like, I like the way you write. It's very, um, it's like old English. I feel like I'm reading from like a thick, dusty old book. <laughs> and I write and go, Hello, <laughs> words. Anyone else for the open mic list? Yeah. Um, thank you guys so much, folks, people, humans, for uh, being here tonight. Um, we love the work that we get to do. It's really like an honor to be able to come out and be vulnerable and maybe mirror some of that so you, you all can get, you're gonna get up here. What's up, what's up? What's up, what's up? Wait, what's your name, what's your name? Everybody please give it up for Erica.
A diverse, divided nation where money is the fixation. We're slipping into temptation. It's the enemy of creation. This is the defining era. Unification can lead us through this hellish terror. That's all I got so far. Once again, thank you, UMBC, um, from, from Jay Little and myself. Um, we love to do this. Um, it's, it's great, so if you have friends on campuses, and you're like, hey, we had the dumbest time the other night, you should call Queen Earth. We love to do more schools and talk to more students, so thank you all so much, everybody. Please get home safe tonight. How many of y'all are hoping for a snow day tomorrow? Yeah.